Good evening. It's good to have you join us again for our midweek service. Tonight my message is the third angel's message in Verity. It's a sermon that I preached uh, some time ago here in this district, and it's one of my Revelation, Revelation series that I am uh, recording on uh, Wednesday nights to share in a wider way uh, with those uh, on Facebook. Uh, this uh, coming uh, Sabbath, Pipestone Church is going to have their first worship service. And I'm going to have more information for those of you who are members in Pipestone shortly. Um, I'm going to be sending out a calling post message for that. And uh, in, so stay tuned and we'll give you some details about what to expect Sabbath morning for that service. But let's uh, review our prayer list for our prayer tonight. Um, we want to continue to remember Roy Bailey in our prayers. His wife, uh, Vivian, passed away last week, and, and uh, we attended his the graveside service up there in Artichoke. Uh, we'll remember him in our prayers. Um, remember our, our health workers, our family members. Uh, Jeanette is in the hospital again. Uh, she may have gone home by now, but um, she had to go back into the hospital. Uh, but uh, we'll continue to remember her in our prayers and grace as well. Uh, Tim and Judy. And, uh, of course, our children and our families again. Dear Father, we pray that you will be with us tonight as we open your word, as we sing, and as we... Uh, share together about what is the third angel's message in the book of Revelation. We thank you for this time that we can come together and, and pray together. We just pray that your Holy Spirit will bless us and be with us. We want to bring these special requests to you. We, we remember Roy in a special way. We just pray that you'll be with him and bless him strengthen him one day at a time and we thank you for the blessed hope that he has in the resurrection and uh so we we just leave that in your hands today and we also want to pray for Jeanette and grace all those who have medical conditions that uh, we want to pray for we want to pray for Tim and Judy. We pray that you continue to be with them too. And all of our health workers, dear Father, this uh, worldwide pandemic is just going on and on. And we, we just pray that you will be with our churches as we consider how to continue to, to worship and and serve you during this time. Please be with America. Please be with our leaders. Please be with those governors that are grappling with these issues. And please help us. Help us most of all to keep our eyes upon Jesus during these times. Knowing that he is able to bring us through whatever is ahead. One day at a time, we trust in you. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we see the signposts along the way. And we pray you'll help us to just serve you each day, one day at a time. So we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, and we pray that you'll be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll, we'll go to our message for tonight. And... Uh, the title of it is The Third Angel's Message in Verity. And we also will invite you to join us Sabbath morning at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Time for our church service. 
At that time, we're going to have part five in our six-part series on the biblical message of salvation. And the title of our message then will be Seeds or Feathers, part two. So I'm going to share my screen now with you so you can follow along in this special message. When you start reading a book, where do you start? Usually, you start at the beginning. And when it comes to Revelation, I'm sure that John intended for us to start there too. But usually the climax of a book is at the end, which is not the case in the book of Revelation. The climax of the book of Revelation is right in the middle. The book of Revelation has seven parts, which are arranged in the pattern of a menorah. The first part and the last part are on the same arm, and the two parts are related. And the second part and the sixth part are on the same arm, and they too are related. And then the third part and the fifth part are also related. And right in the center is the end time message, chapters 12 through 14. The pure woman, the dragon, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, and the message of the three angels. The three angels have been with us since the beginning of the Advent movement. The first angel proclaims the everlasting gospel, calling for everyone on earth to worship God as the creator because the hour of his judgment has come. And the wording points to the Sabbath as the central element in that worship. The second angel proclaims that Babylon is fallen. And then the third angel gives us the most dire warning found in the Bible. Don't worship the beast instead of the creator or receive his mark in your forehead or you will drink the cup of God's wrath. The cup that Jesus drank in the Garden of Gethsemane that, so that we don't have to. And in Revelation 18, a fourth angel lights the whole world with his glory repeats the message that Babylon is fallen and proclaims the invitation, come out of her, my people, and avoid the plagues that are coming upon her. In the months and years following the Minneapolis General Conference session of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1888, Ellen White, along with two young men from the West Coast, became involved in a righteousness by faith revival in which justification by faith was the prominent theme. And some who had been proclaiming the three angels' message for many years were asking the question, what does justification by faith have to do with the third angel's message? Isn't that what, we are, isn't that what we're supposed to be proclaiming? The third angel's message of as Seventh-day Adventist, obedience, commandments, Sabbath and Sunday. And this is what she had to say. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity, in truth. The prophet declares, and after these things I saw another angel, the fourth angel, come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message. And conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. And another place, she says, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. She also said, the point that has been urged upon my mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I have wondered that this matter has not been made the subject of the discourses in our churches. 
throughout the land. When the matter has been kept so constantly urged upon me, and I have made it the subject of nearly every discourse and talk that I, that I have given to the people. Some of our brethren have expressed fears that we shall dwell too much upon the subject of justification by faith. But I hope and pray that none will be needlessly alarmed. For there is no danger in presenting this doctrine as it is set forth in the scriptures. If there had not been a remissness on the part in the past to properly instruct the people of God, there would not now be a necessity of calling a special attention to it. So, how is this doctrine set forth in the scriptures? That is what we're talking, taking a look at today. A good old-fashioned Bible study, and it has two parts. First, laying the glory of man in the dust. And second, doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. The gospel is the good news about God's rescue mission for the sons and daughters of Adam. Romans 3, verse 23 says, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Falling short of the glory of God is kind of like shooting arrows at the sun. Let's say we have a contest. We call for a contest, uh, and we say we're going to have it there and in the church parking lot, and everybody brings their, their bows and their arrows, and uh, we're going to have a contest, and we're going to shoot arrows at the sun. Our aim is to hit the sun, and the first person comes up, and they pull the string back, and they let the arrow fly, and it goes 75 feet into the air and comes back down. And then a, a little one comes up and, and takes up their little bow and arrow, and they aim up at the sun, and they pull back on the string as hard as they can, and they let that little that arrow fly, and it goes eight feet into the air and falls back down to the ground. And then another, maybe it's the head elder this, this time, he takes up the, his bow and he puts his arrow in and he pulls back on that strong bow and that string and he lets it go and it goes 150 feet in the air and comes back down to the ground. Does it really matter if the arrow goes eight feet or 150 feet when the goal is to hit the sun? For there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, how many have sinned? All have sinned. And we would not know sin without the law. And the wages of sin is death. So God devised a rescue plan, a rescue mission for us, and it's revealed to us through the scriptures, especially by Paul. Gospel, the word gospel means good news. It's not good, it's, it's good news, it's not good advice. You know the difference between good news and good advice? Good advice has to do with something that you need to do. Good news is about something that has already been done. And also that it may be, that is promised to be done for you. That's good news. And there's a key phrase that runs all through Paul's letters, and that is, in Christ. In Mashiach. In Christ Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach, it would be in the Hebrew, would say. And the, those phrases tell us something. There are similar phrases like, in him, together with him, in the beloved, in whom, they all express the, the same idea. 
And there's something God accomplished in Christ before we even knew about, about it. And if we're ever going to fully understand the good news of the gospel, we'll need to understand what the Bible means by in Christ. So, when was this plan devised by God? The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And this is what he did. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now there's a temptation as we read this, these, these lines to put ourselves in the center of all of this. That somehow this is talking about what happened to us personally. But this happened to us before any of us were even born. This happened at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, death spread to all mankind because we are all in Adam. So God devised a plan where we could all be saved in Christ. As part of the Council of Peace, back before the foundation of the world, God included us in his Son. He represented all of us. He is the new representative of the race, the new Adam. And so, according to plan, Jesus became the second or the last Adam. The Son of God was united to our humanity there in the womb of Mary. And the only way that Jesus could represent us was to be made like one of us. And when he died, he took us all with him to meet the just demands of the law on the cross of Calvary. We were in him. Paul says, we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And not only did we die in him, his deeds of righteousness were counted as our deeds of righteousness. We're legally redeemed in Jesus. In order to save mankind, God put us in Christ, our substitute and surety, our representative. And because of, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 to 31, and because of him, God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And all who are in Christ Jesus will be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, For as by man... For as by a man, Adam, came death, by a man, Christ Jesus, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. You notice there's an action, and then there's a result. Through one transgression, 
sinful action, there resulted condemnation to all men. Through one act of righteousness, one righteous action, there resulted justification of life to all men. Now, we don't want to misunderstand condemnation. This word condemnation, Jesus said he, did, he came not to condemn this world, but to save. What we're talking about here is legal condemnation. We're not talking about God condemning us. We're talking about being condemned before the law. It's an as an illustration, let me tell you a story about a judge that I met one day when I was living down in Kansas City. Just We had just moved from... Uh, from Kansas City to Columbia, Missouri. And uh, in the process uh, of moving, my tabs had gotten lost in the mail. And so I was driving along, doing my call porter work, and, and all of a sudden I saw the lights behind me. And the policeman came and stopped me. And I said, well, I haven't even received anything in the mail. Uh, I had no idea that I was even uh, expired with my tabs. And he said, well, I'm sorry, but you're, uh, you're in violation, so I'm going to have to give you a ticket. So he gave me a ticket, which I thought was very unfair because I hadn't had even a chance to, to get my tabs. And so... I decided to go to the court and the courthouse and uh, on the court date, I would uh, appeal to the judge. So I appealed to the judge and the policeman was there who had given me the ticket. I explained the situation to the judge. And uh, when I had finished my explanation, the judge sa said, I find you guilty because after all, I was guilty. I was driving with expired tabs. So he said, I find you guilty, but I remit the fine. And since I was on a very tight budget in those days, tighter than today, uh, I was very relieved that he decided to remit the fine. But you see, that judge did not have an attitude of condemnation against me, but he found me condemned before the law, and he found me guilty. And yet, I could see his attitude toward me was a positive one. So, it's the same way with, with God. So what does the scripture say here in Romans 5, verse 18? It says, in Adam we all stand condemned before the law. In Jesus Christ, we all stand justified before the law. It has nothing to do with God's attitude toward us. He loves us with infinite love, and he would save us. But he's also a God of justice, and so before the law, we are condemned in Adam. But in Jesus Christ, wonder of wonders, we stand justified before the law. At the cross, the whole human race was judged in the person of its representative, Jesus Christ. And by his perfect life and his sacrificial death, he satisfied all the demands of the law in our behalf. In Christ, humanity now has a new history that qualifies every believer for heaven. So what happens now when you come to Jesus and you're justified by faith? Well, you might have in mind this justification is just simply forgiveness. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It's much more. Yes, it's forgiveness, but it's much more than just forgiveness. Our history, all our sins are written on the blackboard 
And Jesus is like an eraser that erases it all. But that's not the end of the story. Our slate doesn't remain empty. All the good and holy, righteous deeds that Christ ever did are now transferred to us and now are now written on our blackboard. This is the incredible good news of the gospel. But we must keep in mind that what God has brought to the whole human race by Christ's obedience is a free gift, and it cannot be ours unless we receive it. It's the complete provision has been made for every single person of the human race. But we have to make it our own. We have to accept the gift. So at what point do we become included in Christ? Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. See, the moment that you accept Christ as your Savior and you trust only in him for your salvation, he looks at you as accepted in the beloved. It's just as if when you were born, you received a special birthday present from God. And now it's up to you as to when you open that gift and receive what he has given to you. In fact, that gift was, was wrapped and uh, reserved for you from the foundation of the world, way before you were even born. But now you have the decision of when you're going to open that gift and receive what has been given to you. And there are two options. 1 John 5, verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So it's very simple. Either you have the Son or you don't have the Son. And if you have the Son, you have life. And what assurance do we find in Colossians chapter 1? It says there in Colossians 1, verse 21 and 22, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death <coughs> in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. God looks on everyone who believes in Jesus as his child. And if you believe in his name, you have already received eternal life, even though you may not feel it or think you deserve it. It was that way with the Emancipation of Proclamation. The slaves were legally free even though they hadn't even heard about the fact that they were free yet, or didn't believe it when they did hear about it. And we heard recently about those in Texas who they, had, they sent an army of soldiers there to announce the fact, long, quite a long time after it was proclaimed, and that was when they officially were not officially set free, but that's the time when they, when they decided to, to act upon it. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us all new life through him. But if you don't believe this, it will also not be true for you. But if we hear and we believe God's word, what will be the result? John 5, verse 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And here, the word judgment can be substituted the word condemnation. He does not come into condemnation, but has passed from death 
to life. Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so he's talking about condemnation in the judgment. You do not come into condemnation in the judgment if you believe in Jesus because his character stands in place of your character and God looks at you just as if you had never sinned. And what happens when you accept the gift of Christ's righteousness? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Jesus, as the new, new Adam, is the new creation. And if we're in Christ, then it's true of us as well. Because of Jesus. And as soon as we become this new creation in Christ, we become ministers. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him who to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God's given all of us a choice. We can either decide to be in Adam or in Christ. There's no middle ground. It was not our fault that we were born in Adam, but it will be our fault if we decide not to be in Christ. It's our choice. So the question comes to us once again, what does all this have to do with the third angel's message? Well, Ellen White wrote, justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. I was disappointed the other day when I finished a Bible study. Someone had written on the third angel's message. But it was just the Ten Commandments and obedience to the law of God, Sabbath or Sunday, Mark of the Beast, the seal of God. Nothing about justification by faith. And so how does this, the warning about avoiding the Mark of the Beast and having the seal of God have anything to do with justification by faith. It all has to do with the meaning of the Sabbath. Hebrews 4, verse 1 to 10. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Talking about Israel back there when they were brought out of Egypt. In, in that exodus from Egypt. Verse 3, for we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my wrath, my rest. Uh, Psalms 95, verse 11. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Verse 5, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as, has, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, Joshua was the one after Moses who led them into the promised land. If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest 
has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So the third angel's message is a warning against failing to enter into God's Sabbath rest of justification by faith and finding ourselves following a man-made system, attempting to do our own works in our own power on a man-made counterfeit day of rest. So today, we've heard the good news of justification by faith. Will we enter that Sabbath rest from our own labors to earn God's favor and rest completely in him and his finished work? Justification by faith is the laying of the glory of man in the dust so that God may do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Are you resting in Jesus today? This is the only way that he will then be able to work in you both to choose his will and to do it. None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts there will be no song sung to me that loved myself and washed myself and redeemed myself. Unto me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. But this is the keynote of the song that is sung by many that are here in this world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart. And they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. The whole gospel is comprised in resting in Jesus, in learning of Christ and his meekness and his lowliness. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. There's nothing that we can do of ourselves to merit salvation. This comes to us only as a gift from God. God paid too high of a price for us to ignore his incredible sacrifice for us and the incredible gift that comes to us through that sacrifice. Why not receive this gift anew today? Will you do that with me today? As we sing a closing song, which is, I will sing of my Redeemer. If you have a hymnal, you can look it up in it's 343. I will sing of my Redeemer. And I'm going to look it up here. Here, here it is on my computer. I will sing of my Redeemer. There we go. sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free sing oh sing of my Redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the death and made me free I will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save 
Bathed in his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. I will sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon. Paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life has brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. our heads once again. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for Jesus. He is everything to us. He represents us, and in him we have salvation. In him we have justification to life. In him we have perfect righteousness. In him we are accepted, accepted in the beloved. We have eternal life. He who has the Son has eternal life. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful truth of resting in Jesus, resting in his finished work. For the Sabbath rest that we can have every day because of Jesus. And the message that we have to the world to find rest before it's too late in him not be cut up, caught up in a counterfeit scheme to save the world by our own efforts. But trust in Jesus. Jesus, who is the only answer to all the problems that we face today. And so we put our faith and trust in him again. We thank you for the eternal life that you've given to us in him. And we thank you for your promise that you'll be with us always, even to the end. Come into our hearts. Write your law of love there in our hearts. And help us every day to be more like you. All the time. Covered by your righteousness. And complete in him. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we look forward to seeing you Sabbath morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, Central Daylight Time. And... Uh, We'll, once again, we'll have a message. We'll have our worship service. And we're going to be in number five in our series on the biblical message of salvation. Seeds or feathers, part two. We'll see you then. <laughs>